Well, in case you didn't know, George Bush was re-inaugurated in Washington this past Thursday. Fittingly, given the state of the nation, the inauguration parade route was lined the entire way with armed guards. So many armed guards that they had to stand shoulder to shoulder. As with the rest of America, Washington, D.C. was in a state of siege. The militant air of the entire affair struck me as being very much like those parades you used to see on television or in newsreels in the old Soviet Union, or even Nazi Germany, where military might and strength seemed to be the indication of the greatness of the nation. And George Bush uh, did nothing to dispel that air in his inauguration speech. He proclaimed the desire for world domination, pure and simple. They have the power and the right to decide who is good and who is bad, who shall live and who shall die, what form of government will exist in every nation of the world. Again, he made it clear, if you're with us, you're good. And you get to keep your government, <laughs> no matter how oppressive your government may be. If you're not with us, if you declare your independence from the United States, we will liberate your country and impose what we call democracy on it. No matter how advanced your civilization, no matter how much your people may approve of your own form of government, we will decide whether it will stay. And, of course, we means George Bush. Now, if you've been listening to the show for very long or reading my articles on harrybrown.org, you may easily get the impression that I am obsessed with this war in Iraq. And I shan't argue with you about that. I shan't dispute that. I am obsessed with this war. I'm obsessed with this war because of what this war means and of what this war is doing to America. And by this war, I don't mean just the war in Iraq, but the war on so-called terrorism, the war in Afghanistan, all the wars that have come upon us like a plague in the last three years. But, of course, a lot of people don't see it this way. After Bush's inauguration speech on Thursday, the Wall Street Journal had an editorial on Friday in which it congratulated the president. It said, not since JFK in 1960 has an American president provided such an ambitious and unabashed case for the promotion of liberty at home and abroad. The entire speech was about Iraq as a way of explaining to Americans why the sacrifice our troops are making there is justified. End of quote. And all I can say is, I, and there's the love. Troops don't sacrifice. Only individuals can sacrifice. Individual human beings. For some of them, the sacrifice is a year out of their lives. For others, it's a sacrifice in the sense of living in fear and in danger for six months or a year. But for too many of them, the sacrifice is their entire life. That's not the same as giving a, a quarter of your income to the church or working 15 hours a week in a soup kitchen or spending two days a week helping old folks in a, a nursing home somewhere. When you sacrifice your life, you give up everything. The world no longer exists. What you were no longer exists. No more life, no more love, no more music, no more sports, no more breathing, no more interest in anything. And when you're, you've sacrificed your life, it no longer matters whether Iraq is liberated or oppressed, because you don't exist anymore. It no longer matters whether George Bush is a great leader or a megalomaniac, because you aren't around to be affected by it. You simply do not exist. So George Bush can speak cavalierly about such sacrifices. He can say, freedom is always worth it. He can speak with gratitude about such sacrifices. He can tell young people, as he did in the inauguration speech, that when you die, quote, you will add not just to the wealth of our country, but to its character, end of quote. But he isn't the Messiah. He can't bring these dead people back to life. He can't restore their ability to taste love, to enjoy fellowship, uh, to pursue a career, to bask in the sheer joy of being alive. He can't return a to a mother her dead son. He can't return to a wife her dead husband. He can't raise the dead soldier's children. He can't do anything to restore what he has stolen from these people with his glib assurances about weapons of mass destruction, uh, mobile bioweapons labs, unarmed planes dropping chemical weapons on the east coast of the United States, about freedom always being worth the price. The dead are dead, and they can't come back. They won't dance at any inaugural balls or attend any banquets. They won't even eat at the local coffee shop anymore. Never, never, never again. They are dead, and George Bush killed them. He killed them as certainly as though he had taken a rocket launcher and fired it into their homes or into their cars. If he didn't know that his plan to liberate people who hadn't asked to be liberated, to bring democracy to people who hadn't asked for democracy, would lead to the deaths of thousands of people, he is not only incompetent and unfit to hold office, he is surely psychopathic and needs to be incarcerated. Only a psychopath 
would stand in the midst of thousands of security guards and speak of, quote, the force of human freedom, unquote. Only a man so insulated from the real world by palace sycophants, by little Napoleons filled with utopian fantasies, and by callous, ambitious schemers to whom the lives of others mean absolutely nothing. Only a man so insulated could possibly speak of, quote, the expansion of freedom in all the world, end of quote. Only a man with no link to reality can sacrifice lives and families and then say, quote, every man and woman on this earth has rights and dignity and matchless value because they bear the image of the maker of heaven and earth, end of quote. But only a man with no link to reality could sacrifice lives and families and then have the gall to say, quote, every man and woman on this earth has rights and dignity and matchless value because they bear the image of the maker of heaven and earth, end of quote. Only a snake oil salesman could invade other countries and then say that no, quote, human being aspires to live at the mercy of bullies, unquote. Only a man divorced from human reason could imprison people, probably for life, without due process of law, and then say that those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Only a liar could proclaim that you're either with us or against us, and then say, no one is fit to be a master and no one deserves to be a slave. Yes, I have become obsessed with this war. Joseph Stalin is reputed to have said that a single death is a tragedy, but a million deaths is a statistic. Well, no matter how many people die in Iraq, to me every one of them is a tragedy. A tragedy that I will neither ignore nor forget. And that's why I'm obsessed with this war. That's why I'm obsessed with each and every death, because each and every death is not just a tragedy, it's murder. And I will never forget the people whose lives were snuffed out, the people whose lives were cut short, nor will I forget the people who lost those that they love. Neither will I ever forget who it was that killed them. They were killed by a relatively small group of people in Washington who believed that they were put here on earth by God to remake the world. Not remake it in God's image, but in their own. And if there have been war crimes, which we continually hear that there have, the criminals should be put on trial. And I believe that there have been war crimes. And the criminals are in Washington, D.C., the crime was not committed by America. It is not America that should be put on trial. It is the people in Washington who have hijacked America and done these things in America's name. Yes, I'm obsessed with this war, but I'm obsessed with it because I am obsessed with life. I love life. I love my wife, Pamela. I love being in love with my wife. I love music. I love food. I love reading. I love sports. I even love sleeping. I taste and love so many aspects of life. I don't ever want to die, and I don't want anyone else to die, except maybe those who treat life so trivially that they can speak of the sacrifice of other people's lives as being a worthwhile price to pay for some idealistic goal they think that they're going to achieve, a goal that will put them in the history books in an exalted position. But they're like children in their fantasies. They don't even make an effort to discover that others before them have harbored the same fantasies and failed miserably to achieve their goals, not coming even the slightest bit close that without an understanding of history and the cultures of other peoples, they have no hope either to persuade or even to dominate other people. And they pay no attention to the fact that in the process of ending tyranny in our world, as the President put it, they are imposing a new tyranny in their own country, our country. Yes, I love life. And so I will continue to fight against this war with every bit of strength, every bit of talent, every resource that I can spare, because I love life and I don't want to see anyone die. Well, let's go to the phones now. Kayleen in Massachusetts is with us. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello. Hello there. Um, um, I completely agree with everything you said. Uh, who is the tyrant after all? Um, who, is the, who is the what? The tyrant after all. Oh, yeah. The U.S. government. We are the tyrant. Not we, not America. Well, our, our huge government and our terribly big uh, tyrannical government, we are actually the tyrant. Going around uh, telling everybody else who's the tyrants and trying to control it. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. But um, the reason I called is rather unrelated to what you're speaking about, but I wanted to, uh, you have some answers for me. I was wondering, we have a car who uh, is attached to the Pontiac, which um, was uh, assembled in Canada. And uh, I've, I've owned a Toyota before that was uh, made with Japanese parts and assembled in the U.S. And uh, I wondered uh, what is exactly the logic behind uh, countries sort of building parts for cars and uh, then assembling them in a different country. And I wondered if it had something uh, perhaps to do with 
taxation or labor laws or labor prices? Well, sometimes it, they have any insight into that. Sometimes it does depend uh, upon the laws that uh, they are more favorable in some places. For years and years, movies have been made in Vancouver and Toronto uh, mm -hmm. because the union situation there was much more favorable to getting movies made at a, at a decent price. Mm -hmm. And uh, companies, uh, it is their business to figure out where is the best place to have things done. And sometimes it may seem illogical to strangers looking in on it. Why in the world would you build the parts in the United States and then ship the parts out to uh, Canada and have them assembled there and then bring the car back in? Right. Uh, but all, all you can say is that they have figured out that it is less expensive to do it that way than it would be to do it all here or to do it all there or to reverse the process and buy the parts from Canada and assemble exactly. here. Exactly. That's why I wanted to you have some insight as to whether with taxation, labor, it may, it may, that, it, that it, outweighed maybe taxation or lack of taxation outweigh labor or, or something like that? It may well be. Uh, I know nothing about the individual circumstance, so I can't tell you. As I said, the only reason I hate this war is because I love life, and I love music. And I love to hear from new callers, and I believe that Jack in Michigan is a new caller. So good evening, Jack. Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, good evening, Harry. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I remember I, uh, I saw you, oh, it was a number of years ago. You were on uh, uh, a, a political debate uh, with, uh, uh, I believe it was four or five other uh, candidates from the various parties, and you were the only one that made any sense. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I spent, uh, I was in Vietnam for 19 months, from uh, uh, January of uh, 1967 through August of uh, 1968. And I was probably one of these people, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to believe that my government was lying to me, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and. Naturally, under, under such circumstances, it, it would almost mean going crazy if you knew that you were there on false pretenses. Well, yeah, you know, so, you know, you, you know you're brought up to believe, you know, you're brought up to believe that, that what your government says is right, you know, and, and it really, when you start looking into it, and, and you've been responsible for that quite a bit, because, you know, I'm, I've been reading some of this stuff on Lou Rockwell and, and, and that, and, uh, and thank God for the Internet, because now you can really dig into some of this stuff, and, and it's appalling. <laughs> and... The only thing, I look at this, this war in Iraq, and it's like we didn't learn a thing. We didn't learn a single thing when we were in Vietnam because we're doing the same silly thing all over again. Well, you know, to a certain extent, it is that if George Bush had not won the presidency and Al Gore was doing what George Bush was doing, George Bush might be among those people protesting the most. He might be uh, giving speeches around the country about uh, how we have to be very, very careful about overreaching and about uh, trying to impose our way on other people and so forth. But power is a heady thing, and uh, that's why politicians don't seem to learn anything from the past, because it's not their past, and they have the present, and the present has all this power connected with it and all this ability to it. Why not, why not use that power? Why not use that ability? And it's not too hard to convince yourself that you're doing it for good, that you're really doing it to liberate these people. You're really doing it to make America safer, uh, and that the fact that you're just going to get a good mark in the history books, well, that's just icing on the cake. Yeah, well, when I, was, when I was over in Vietnam, I believe, well, I convinced myself that we were really helping these people, but what actually what happened, we destroyed their economy. And because we went in, the average Vietnamese out working in a rice paddy would maybe make $100 a year, whatever that meant to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they didn't live the same kind of life that we did. And, of course, we showed up, and, and we got paid several hundred dollars a month, and much of that was disposable, and, and we literally destroyed their economy, you know. By going in and, and spending yeah, by money. Yeah, and sticking our nose in where it didn't belong. Sure, and, you're, and with your money, you were able to garner all the resources that then were no longer available to, it, it, to them. That, and I was a part of it. I, you know, I, I, I admit it, and for, for years, you know, uh, even after we left, I said, well, you know, uh, we did the right thing, and then I started thinking, which is sometimes dangerous, you know. Uh, but I've got something I'd like to send you if I could get a mailing address. While I was over there, okay, mm -hmm. I made a tape recording of the morning radio show. It started at 6 in the morning and ended at 9. They called it the Dawn Buster. Good morning, Vietnam. That's the one. And I made it very interestingly on July 4th, Independence Day of 1968. And it's complete. It has the news. It has all the propaganda and everything. And I finally got around to putting it on a free CD set. And, and I'd be very happy to send you a copy of this. Well, I appreciate that. Would you, you have a computer, right? I do. Well, just email me uh, tonight to question at harrybrown.org, and okay. I'll, I'll send you a mailing address. I'll, I'll do that then. Uh, well, I, I appreciate that. I look forward to hearing. Well, it. yeah. It's, if you start at six in the morning, it'll run through the time until nine. Mm -hmm. It's spooky. <laughs> well, fortunately, I'm not up at six in the morning. We don't yeah, have to worry about that. You can pretend. <laughs> yes. Harry, it, it's a real pleasure talking to you. I got a lot of other things I could say, but I'll save them for another night. Okay, I appreciate that. Glad to hear from you, and uh, I'm glad you uh, have gotten through all that you, uh, all the hangover you had from Vietnam. Because coming to that realization is not easy, and I applaud you for doing so. It takes a, a good deal of moral courage to do that. So uh, I admire what you've done. Hey, well, it's very good to talk to you, Harry. Thank you. And um, it's very good to talk to you, too, folks. And if you have anything to say, give me a call at 1-800-259-9231. There have been uh, 
a number of emails that I have received in the last week or two that have quoted Dwight Eisenhower's pronouncements about the military-industrial complex. And uh, here's one on my screen right now. Apparently, the exact quote, I haven't looked it up, so I presume this is the exact quote. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Uh, in other words, that once the generals and the industrialists get in bed together, and of course by the generals he doesn't really mean those that are out in the field so much as those that are in Washington, the chiefs of staff, and the people who are lobbying for bigger appropriations, uh, but once those generals and the industrialists get in bed for, with each other, uh, the country's in real trouble, and it has, as has been seen in fascist Italy and other places in the, in the history of the world. But the interesting thing about this quote, which no one has mentioned in any of the emails I got, is that Eisenhower made this statement when, in his farewell address, he had been president for eight years, and as he's leaving office and no longer can do anything about it, he suddenly tells us that there is this big, big, big problem in Washington, and you better watch out for it. Well, what did he do about it in his eight years? I don't recall him vetoing any big military bills or doing anything about this. He didn't even mention it for eight years. And the reason I mention it is because it is so, so common for a politician to go through his time in Washington, whether in Congress or in the presidency or someplace else, just simply making government bigger and bigger and bigger, then getting out of government and writing a book about all the terrible things that will happen if we don't stop this growth of government and we don't stop all of these terrible things that are going on in Washington, something that had never been mentioned by the politician during his time in office. A strange phenomenon. Before we go back to the phones, I received an email from Justin, who lives in cyberspace. And he gave me a link to a website that is continually updating the estimated cost of the war in Iraq. And right now it's at $151 billion. And as Justin says, increasing as we speak. Well, I'm speaking, he's writing. The link is very simple. I can give it to you orally. It's costofwar.com. Costofwar.com. But I've also put it on my radio links page on the website. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, you can see right at the top of the home page some uh, links to other parts of the website, one of which is the radio links page, and there I have links to articles and websites that have been mentioned on the show, and so far tonight the only one I have is costofwar.com. Thank you, Justin, for sending that. And incidentally, I do welcome articles and links and such uh, being sent to me. I am glad to have them. I can't send personal replies to show my gratitude, but know that I am glad to have them. I come across a great many articles that way because somebody has let me know about it at a location that I never probably would have stumbled on, into on my own. All right, back to the phone. So let's talk with Anthony in Arkansas. Good evening, Anthony. Good evening, Harry. What's up? Uh, I just wanted to comment on some of your, uh, your comments that you made earlier. Um, I think you mentioned uh, about George Bush, whether he was just out of touch with reality or if he was uh, a megalomaniac regarding uh, the, the war and if he knew, you know, didn't he realize that there were going to be casualties and, and, and that comment that you made? Mm -hmm. uh, were you aware of the, uh, the comment that he made to Pat Robertson before the war? Um, that sounds familiar. What was it? Well, it was, um, the, the story goes that uh, Pat Robertson had, had spoke to the president and, and told him that he needed to uh, prepare the Americans uh, for all the casualties that will be in the war. And, and he, uh, I don't know what is, what's wrong with him, but he actually told uh, Pat Robertson that there weren't going to be any casualties. I, I believe I had, I believe I read that, and I, if I did, I would have saved it. So I'll take a look for that at the uh, news break at the top of the hour, and if I can find it, I'll uh, give it to our listeners because okay. that does sound very familiar. There is this this sense all through that God has told me that why I'm here, and, and you know when. Somebody asked George Bush, uh, did he, when he was making the decision about going to war, did he discuss it with his father, George Herbert Walker Bush, and the 41st President of the United States? And George Bush, George W. Bush, said, no, I didn't. I appealed to a higher father. And, in other words, I went to God to get my uh, decision about this. Yeah. And uh, all, th all through this, there is this theological error over it. And regardless of how you believe about God, whether you believe God takes an active intervention in human affairs, or whether you believe, uh, whether or not you believe, that God answers prayers, or whether or not it is possible to get a message from God. With, however you believe this about these things, you have to wonder about this, because even if it is possible for people to talk with God and to get specific answers from God, it doesn't mean that everybody who thinks he has gotten an answer from God really did. And, and the definition of a fanatic is somebody who hears voices and goes out and kills people uh, yeah. because the voices told him to do so. Personally, I think that the Bush is lying about that. Um, uh, you were also commenting about, you said that you know if Bush didn't get elected and if Gore were the one doing all this, that Bush may very well be the uh, be out protesting and and saying different things. And I think you're, you were right on there because um, before before he became president during the debates, he made comments like we didn't need to be going around 
telling everybody else how to live. And right. He didn't believe in a. He wanted a more humble foreign policy. Right. He did, he did not believe that nation building was a good idea. Yeah. And so I, I don't know where the guy's coming from. I I, I kind of think that he's crazy or there's something definitely wrong here. Well, it's a, an interesting thing that, of course, that all changed on 9/11, as he likes to put it. The world changed on 9/11. Everything changed on 9/11, and he uses that as an excuse for having changed from what he said in 2000. Sure. But it's an interesting thing about 9/11. Um, I've mentioned before about Rudolph Giuliani, who uh, just simply showed up at Ground Zero and was acclaimed as America's mayor, the great mayor, and this, that, and all these other things, when all he did was call the uh, television networks every time he was going to go over to Ground Zero so that he made sure that there were television cameras there to see him talking to the firemen and having a uh, steel helmet on, you know, and so yeah. on and so on. And much the same was true with Bush. He went there and he gave a speech and with a bullhorn and so forth, and, the, and America claimed this great leader. Uh, my God, he showed leadership. Thank God we had somebody like George Bush at the time, and he didn't do anything except go out and kill a whole bunch of people who had nothing to do with 9-11. Right. And uh, it is strange how people can build these reputations. Uh, but I didn't mean to, to jump in there. You were talking about something else. Did you get to say everything you wanted to? Yes, sir. I sure did. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much for calling, Anthony. I really appreciate it. And let's quickly get back to the phones to Ken in South Carolina. Good evening, Ken. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Uh, thanks a lot for all you do. The website, your journal, the books you write, uh, the free market news uh, videos that you do are absolutely fantastic. I'm just learning a ton. Well, thank you. Thank you, Richard Mayberry. I wasn't able to listen to you live. I did uh, check the archives, and he's just terrific. Uh, you guys make quite a team, and I'm learning a, a lot from you. Good. Uh, the question that I had was, did, um, did Congress ever formally declare war? Or, or was this just an executive order to go to, uh, to war? On Iraq? Yeah. Uh, what Congress did was authorize George Bush to do something about Iraq, and I can't tell you the exact words that were used, but it was not a formal declaration of war as required in the Constitution. Uh, what they did was pass the buck. They said, you decide what to do, George Bush, and in uh, according to our Constitution, you cannot do that. Congress cannot turn over to the executive branch the uh, power and responsibility to do certain things anymore than the president could say to Congress, all right, you manage the Joint Chiefs of Staff during wartime, and so on. Uh, there are very distinct, separate responsibilities Responsibilities, and that's part of the balance of power and the checks and balances in our Constitution. So we have not had a war that had a declaration of war since World War II. That was the last time Congress declared war against anybody. I'm surprised that people don't make more mistakes think on this, especially the opposing parties and the media. That's just a blatant violation of the Constitution. Maybe I'm just a little overboard when it comes to the Constitution. You know, listen to what you say. I just started reading Michael Bandera's book, which I highly recommend. It's just been great so far. And I know that George Bush was looking at Constitution prior to his inauguration. They have pictures of everything. And I'm wondering if he ever, ever has read it, and if, um, you know, if they really need one in my event, maybe you can just send ours over because we're really not using ours. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just so frustrating. And uh, you mentioned the cost of the word on website. Um, I'm wondering if those figures are government figures, you know, $150 billion. It sure seems like a lot more because... Uh, well, they, rely, they have to rely on the government for the figures, but it's a, a question of what you uh, count, because a great deal of the cost comes not in the military budget, but in other budgets that uh, support the military and may be part of the education budget, maybe part of other things that are actually going into the war in Iraq. So somebody's got to dig that out, and of course, uh, five different people trying to do so will come up with five different answers. But as you're pointing out, it all comes from the government to begin with. And just quick, uh, I talked to a radio show host last night. He said we were doing the war on the cheap in Iraq with the women and everything. I pointed out that we're spending more than $20 billion a year. He said we'd spend a lot more. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's a conservative. Of course. It's amazing. Yeah, conservatives are all against the government. We know that. Thanks so much. Anthony in Arkansas mentioned about um, the conversation that George Bush had with Pat Robertson, and I did find the article in my files, and then Anthony sent me also a link to an article which was the follow-up to the article that I had. So first of all, my article, which came from CNN, said the founder of the U.S. Christian Coalition said Tuesday he told President George W. Oh, pardon me, this was October 20th, 2004, so it wasn't this past Tuesday. Founder of the U.S. Christian Coalition said Tuesday he told President George W. Bush before the invasion of Iraq that he should prepare Americans for the likelihood of casualties. But the president told him, we're not going to have any casualties. Pat Robertson, an ardent Bush supporter, said he had that conversation with the president in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, I'd be smirching my hometown. Before the March 2003 invasion, U.S. led... Hmm, typo here. Before the March 2003 U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, he described Bush in the meeting as the most self-assured man I have ever met in my life. And Robertson said, you remember Mark Twain said he looks like a contented Christian with four aces. <laughs> I like that expression. I mean, he was just sitting there like, I'm on top of the world, Robertson said on the CNN Paul is on Now show. And Robertson goes on to say, I warned him about this war. I have deep misgivings about this war, deep misgivings. And I was trying to say, Mr. President, you'd better prepare the American people for casualties. Robertson said the president then told him, oh, no, we're not going to have any casualties. And uh, so it goes on from there. And a little later in the article, he's, uh, 
Asked why Bush has refused to admit to mistakes on Iraq, Robertson said, I don't know this politics game. You know, you can never say you were wrong because the opposition grabs onto it, saying, see, he admitted he screwed up. And with that pause, I have reached over to the printer and gotten the article that Anthony then sent to me, sent me the link for. And it begins by saying, a White House spokesman denied Wednesday that President Bush told Christian Coalition founder Pat Robertson that he did not expect casualties from the invasion of Iraq. The president never made such a comment, White House Press Secretary Scott McClellan said. Senior Bush campaign advisor Karen Hughes, a longtime confidant of the president, said she was certain Bush would not have said anything like that to Robertson. Perhaps he misunderstood, but I've never heard the president say any such thing. And then it goes on to repeat what Robertson said. And Senator Kerry quickly seized on Robertson's account and issued a statement challenging Bush to say whether the 700 Club founder and 1988 GOP presidential candidate was telling the truth. We believe President Bush should get the benefit of the doubt here, Kerry spokesman Mike Curry said in a news release, but he needs to come forward and answer a very simple question. Is Pat Robertson telling the truth when he said you didn't think there'd be any casualties, or is Pat Robertson lying? And on and on it goes. Um, I, I'm quite surprised that Robertson would even reveal that if it had taken place, and of course it is very possible that he misunderstood or that Pat Robertson was just hearing voices again. I don't know what the truth of it is, but... Any way you look at it, it seems strange that he would make such a statement publicly because, as the article says, he is an ardent Bush supporter and has been all along. So, difficult to know. And now let's have another correction here. Gene in cyberspace has sent me an email saying, To be fair to President Eisenhower, he did resist doing things that someone without his military credentials would have done. He was pressured to make a preemptive strike against the Soviets, but didn't do so. He did not send troops to Vietnam, although we did finance the French effort there. He helped bring an end to the Korean War. He also did not succumb to the claims of a missile gap with the Soviets to start a large missile buildup. Although he's not perfect from our perspective, he was probably pretty good for a Democrat or Republican. Well, I won't argue with you about uh, that, Gene. Uh, I will mention, however, that in 1958, Senator Goldwater made a very famous speech on the floor of the Senate that he was appalled absolutely appalled by the budget that Eisenhower had submitted to Congress for the fiscal year 1959. And that budget was so outrageously expensive that he didn't go or couldn't see how any Republican could possibly, uh, in good conscience, submit such a thing. And you know how big that budget was? Eighty billion dollars. One thirtieth the size of the current federal budget. But it was big enough to cause an outrage among some Republicans. Eighty billion dollars. You know, there are some arguments among libertarians about how big or how small government should be or whether there should ever be any government at all. But I, <laughs> I venture to think that there probably isn't a libertarian in America who, if given the opportunity to push a button and restore that $80 billion outrageous budget of 1958, wouldn't break his finger in the process of getting that button pushed. Gene also sent me a, an email saying the most depressing thing about Bush's speech was his continual use of the words liberty and freedom. I agree with most of what he said about liberty. I just wish he would govern as if he really meant it. Yeah, on the Daily Show with John Stewart, on um, I guess it was I guess it was Thursday evening. Right after they they usually are a day late, but in Thursday evening's broadcast, they showed Bush saying over and over again about freedom and liberty, and they had a counter and they came up with I think it was 21 references to freedom and something like 10 references to liberty in a speech that was only about 20 minutes long. Eric uh, says in an email, the American Empire is so much like the Roman Empire that I often equate our presidents with leaders like the likes of Nero, Caligula, or even Claudius. All those emperors loved war. The Roman citizen could care less unless he was a professional soldier. The American citizen doesn't care either unless he is cons uh, conscripted. And with a professional army, the rest of the sea war is just another Hollywood movie that we can turn off when we get bored. I am reminded of a thought that rings true. When 100,000 die in the Tusami, it is called a tragedy. But the truth is that a real tragedy is losing one's pinky finger to a circular saw. In the movie Ben-Hur, Pilate says to Ben-Hur, a wise man understands the world he lives in, and today the world is Rome. And Eric says, today it's Washington, D.C. History repeats itself. And during the break, I had a chance to look at the rest of that CNN follow-up to the Pat Robertson statement, and apparently Pat Robertson stuck by what he had said, that uh, he really had said to Bush that... Uh, Oh, Dr. Alita, Robertson said, I mean, the Lord told me it was going to be A, a disaster, and B, messy. I warned him about casualties. And still, though, despite the fact that Bush paid no attention to him, Robertson believes that uh, the blessing of heaven is upon him, meaning George Bush. And finally, he said, even if he stumbles and messes up, and he's had his share of stumbles and gaps, I just think God's blessing is on him. Well, I wish God's blessing had been on all those people who have died. And died for what? This new, better world, 
like the New World Order that his father said was going to come out of the Gulf War, like the Four Freedoms and the New World of No War because of the United Nations that was going to come out of World War II, like the World Safe for Democracy and the War to End All Wars, which was going to come out of World War I, and the Christianizing of the Philippine people that was going to come from the United States taking over the Philippines at the end of the Spanish-American War, spoken by a president, incidentally, who didn't know that the majority of the Philippine natives were Catholics, but he was going to Christianize them. And it was so typical of every president. I don't know of a single president in the last hundred years or so who has, any, who has had any knowledge of history to speak of, who had any knowledge to speak of, of foreign peoples and their cultures and what they believe and what they wanted and who they love and who they hate. And yet these various presidents like Teddy Roosevelt, William McKinley, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, uh, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, they were all going to change the world for the better. And not one of them has a single thing to show for it. And out of the millions that died in World War I, I believe it was historian Howard Zinn who summed up the results of World War I and said that not any single person can demonstrate that anything was gained from that war that was worth even the loss of one single human life. And that's the way I feel about Iraq. It was not worth one life. And as has been said so often before, if it is worth the sacrifice of human lives, why aren't the people who believe that over there sacrificing their lives? Why is it that they're always talking about other people's lives? Why is it when it is said that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs? Why is it always somebody else's eggs that get broken? And why is it that the omelet never materializes? Well, you know, I spoke in the last uh, segment about the magic button in reference to the idea that if there were a magic button that any of us could push to bring back an $80 billion federal budget, it wouldn't matter whether we believe there should be no government or that the right size should be $100 billion or $50 billion or whatever. I doubt that there's any one of us who wouldn't go crazy trying to get to that button to push it as quickly as possible. But... Uh, that brings up something that I thought I should mention. Um, it was my friend Michael Cloud who first brought it up. He pointed out that when you're talking with someone and you talk about repealing the income tax, about ending our involvement in wars by a more realistic foreign policy, and, and or ending the drug war in order to reduce crime and fear in our cities, and various other libertarian proposals, that sometimes people will agree with the proposals and say that, that's fine. I agree. It would be better. We'd all be better off if you did whatever it is you had just mentioned. But it isn't going to happen. Uh, you're, you're not going to make it happen. So why are we talking about this? And Michael said that the next step when you talk to somebody whose reaction is one of saying, I agree in general that the ideas are good, but they'll never happen. He says the next step is to say, but suppose it could happen. Suppose there were a button sitting on this table, and all you had to do was to push the button to end the income tax and reduce government appropriately to a size that would be covered by the taxes that are left. Or suppose you could push that button and end the drug war by tomorrow morning. Suppose you could push that button and end all involvement in foreign adventures by our government. Would you push that button? If there were a button there to do that, would you push it? And the answer really is yes. Yes, everyone would push that button if he had the chance. And it's very important to establish with people that this is what they really want. Once you have put it in their minds, it's going to be very difficult for them to get it out of their minds. It's very difficult for somebody to hold a conversation with you for five minutes talking about how wonderful it would be if we could get rid of the income tax or if we could get America out of the war business uh, or any of these things, if we could get America out of health care, if we could get America out of education or any of these areas. It's very difficult for somebody to hold a conversation about those things and recognize how much how good it would be, how much he would love to see them gone and how good it would be, and then not think about it again tomorrow or the day after or the day after that or maybe all three of those days. And once somebody is thinking about it, it's very, very difficult to back away from it, to take no more interest in it, to not be bitten with the bug of wanting to do something to make it happen. And one way to impress upon an individual just how much he wants it is to say, if there were a button here, would you push it? This idea actually first came from Leonard Reed, Leonard Reed was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, and he worked for the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, and I'm not sure exactly what his position was there, whether he was the head of it uh, or uh, some kind of a spokesman, but he then, uh, I believe it was during World War II or at the end of World War II, uh, set up the Foundation for Economic Education in a suburb of New York City called Irvington-on-Hudson, 
And he was speaking before a group of people at the end of the war, the end of the Second World War, when people were saying that Congress had to work out a transition policy to a free market. During the war, they had set up all these economic boards and so on. There were wage and price controls, and, and there was really dictatorial control over the economy by the government. Uh, you had to get, if you were an industrialist, you had to get permission to acquire the steel that you needed to produce your product or whatever. Uh, the war production board just controlled everything, and it was really the ultimate fascist economy. It was no different from what was going on in Germany and Italy. And so the end of the war came, and everybody was afraid that now there was going to be a great, great depression, and that Congress had to work out some kind of transition program. After all, 10 million soldiers were in uniform, and 9-plus million of those were going to come back and be looking for jobs. So where, how are they going to get jobs? Where are they going to work? I mean, uh, what are we going to do here? Congress has got to work out something. So Leonard Reed was giving this speech, and he said that if on this lectern in front of me there were a button, and if I were to push that button, and every one of the controls, every one of the regulations, every one of the dictates, every one of the commands, every one of the boards were all abolished in one second because I had pushed this button. I would push the button without hesitation. I am not the least bit afraid of a free market and how a free market will solve the problems. And as it turned out, he was right. Congress dilly-dallied so long in coming up with this great transition plan that by the time they might have figured out something, the economy was thriving. All the soldiers had been uh, mustered out of the army. They had found jobs. The economy was operating at a level far, far above anything that had happened before, even before the Great Depression that started in 1929. Uh, the country had gone through 16 long years of depression. It started in 1929 with the stock market crash, which led to a number of other things happening in the economy, and it supposedly hit bottom in 1933 when several thousand banks closed and all kinds of things were in bad shape, and the stock market hit its uh, low for that uh, whole period, and then rebounded. And that, the way the history books, at least the school books, tell it is that Roosevelt's policies coming into office in 1933 pulled the country out of the Depression, but it, those policies didn't. In 1939, there were still 19 million people unemployed in America. And although there were ups and downs during the 30s, the fact of the matter is that America was still in a state of depression when the war started. And the war did not, contrary to other people's opinions, pull the country out of a depression because uh, people couldn't do anything to raise their standard of living. They couldn't buy refrigerators. You couldn't buy a new car. You couldn't buy tires for your car if your uh, tires wore out. You couldn't do any of the things we normally take for granted and people took for granted in America. So even though all kinds of money was being thrown around by the federal government during that period, and even though 10 million people had been taken out of the workforce, making it easier for other people to find a job, and there were new jobs opening up in defense plants and so on, the fact still remains that people's standard of living were not raised from what it was during the 1930s. So the Depression actually lasted straight through until 1945. And as Leonard Reed said, if I could push a button and end all of these controls and everything else in one second, I would do so. And that's the way it turned out. Uh, most of the boards were abolished. A lot of things did hang on and still are with us today, like the withholding tax, uh, taking the income tax out of your paycheck, every single paycheck, rather than you settling up with the government once a year, which was the case until the Second World War when it was changed in order to hurry up the financing, uh, hurry up the money coming into the federal government. So the point is that freedom always follows, finds a solution. The free market finds a solution because it is in somebody's self-interest to do so. If you've got a horrendous problem, if you can think of a horrendous problem that would occur if you abolished all the boards and regulatory agencies that exist in the United States today, if you can think of a horrendous problem, then what you're thinking of is an opportunity for someone to make a profit by solving that problem. And that's the beauty of the free market, is you don't have to know how to solve the problem. You can say, yeah, but there's no way to do this or that. And I would have to agree with you up to a point. I would have to say, yes, I don't know of a way to do it. You don't know of a way to do it. But the fact of the matter is that there are 200 million people out there. And among those 200 million people, there probably are thousands of people who, if presented with this problem, would know how to solve it. And those people are going to hear about the problem sooner or later, and at least a 100 of them are going to think very seriously about going into business to solve the problem and making a small fortune in a hurry because of the great need to solve this problem is going to make it very, very profitable for anybody who does. And out of those who decide to do it, one of them is going to get there first, and the others are going to trail along, and probably several of them will make a great deal of money, and the problem will be solved. So when somebody says to you, I bet you can't tell me how a free market would solve this problem or how a free market would, be do, would do this or that or anything else, don't be intimidated by it. Just tell them, I don't know how to make a car either, but I know how to drive one, and I got one in my garage even though I didn't know how to make it. All right, somebody was nice enough to send a, an article 
from the, today's New York Times. And it's very interesting. It's about a city in the Netherlands called Rachten, R-A-C-H-T-E-N. And the author of the article, Sarah Leal, says that a friend took her to an intersection. I haven't read this whole article, but she, she was taken to an intersection, a large intersection, in a busy center of town where, as she says, several odd things immediately became clear. Not only was it virtually naked, stripped of all lights, signs, and road markings, but there was no division between the road and the sidewalk even. It was basically a bare brick square. But in spite of the apparently anarchical layout, the traffic, which was a steady stream of trucks, cars, buses, motorcycles, bicycles, and pedestrians, moved along fluidly and easily as if directed by an invisible conductor. Now, Miss Lyle may not know, but there probably was an invisible hand. Back to the article. When Mr. Monderman, a traffic engineer and the intersection's proud designer, deliberately failed to check for oncoming traffic before crossing the street, the driver slowed down for him. No one honked or shouted rude words out of the window. Who has the right of way, he asked rhetorically. I don't care. People here have to find their own way, negotiate for themselves, use their own brains. <laughs> Used by some 20,000 drivers a day, the intersection is part of a road design revolution, pioneered by the 59-year-old Hans Monderman. His work in Friesland, the district in northern Holland that takes in Drachten, oh, I'm sorry, that was Drachten, not Drachten, is increasingly seen as the wave of the future in Europe. His philosophy is simple, if counterintuitive. To make communities safer and more appealing, Mr. Monderman argues, you should first remove the traditional paraphernalia of their roads, the traffic lights and speed signs, the signs exhorting drivers to stop, Slow down and merge, the center lines separating lanes from one another, even the speed bumps, speed limit signs, bicycle lanes, and pedestrian crossings. In his view, it is only when the road is made more dangerous, when drivers stop looking at signs and start looking at other people, that driving becomes safer. All those signs are saying to cars, this is your space and we've organized your behavior, so that as long as you behave this way, nothing can happen to you, and that is the wrong story. Well, that's a very interesting article. I'm going to put a link to it on the website, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's much longer than what I've given you. I just gave you a taste of it. In fact, that's all I've read of it. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes uh, with our final thoughts, so thanks for tuning in. I really like what this traffic designer, and he's not really a traffic designer, but the designer of these intersections in Drockton, has said that all those traffic signs there are saying to cars, this is your space, and we've organized your behavior, so as long as you behave this way, nothing can happen to you. And that is the wrong story. And that's exactly what we have with regulatory agencies in the United States. Gee, we don't have to worry. The FDA is making us safe. And in the process, the FDA is killing thousands of people every year. And it is giving people a false assurance. And all these other things are giving people a false assurance. All the stuff like the deposit insurance for your bank account, which we found out with the savings and loan crisis in the 80s, was not as sure and safe as we have been led to believe. And we find that Social Security doesn't have the money there to take care of all the people it's promised it was going to take care of. It's a false assurance. But when that assurance is pulled out from other people, just as when World War II ended, Congress did not provide a roadmap to freedom and prosperity, people take care of themselves, and they do what is necessary. And they wind up far safer than they were with the regulation. They wind up far more prosperous than they were with the government direction. And in the process, they have made themselves better people so that if a real crisis comes along in a year from now or two years from now, they will be better equipped to take care of it. Freedom is the answer to every question. Government is not the answer to any question. Government is force, and force does not produce the kind of results that people like you and me and others listening to the show want to see for America. So don't be beguiled into thinking that there is some government program that could make things better. Well, thank you again for tuning in. I hope you have a good week. I hope you do, as I always advise, which is to do something nice for yourself and your family this week. And I think one of these weeks I'm going to ask you to tell me what you did this past week. So take care of yourself. This is Harry Brown. We'll talk again soon.